Amen. There is a Redeemer this morning. Amen. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to Community Bible Baptist Church for the beginning of a very, very special week. And we're glad you're here to kick it off with us. Let's stand as we begin our time of worship this morning. Let's begin with, we have heard the joyful sound that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Lift your voices with me this morning. Number 281. Sing out with me on verse number one. Ready? Oh, we have heard. trying to get the screen up and going. Number 281. Let's try that number 281 in your red songbooks. And uh, let's begin, I think, on verse, let's go to verse number three. Sing above the battle strife. Join with me. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, sing and song. Jesus still does save this morning. Let's go to number 145 in our songbooks. Number 145, I love to tell the story. There we go. I think our screen is back up. Join me on verse number one. I love to tell the story. Sing it with me. Ready? I love to tell the story.
today. What a great crowd. So many guests and visitors, and we're honored that you're here on our first day of our missions revival. Years and years and years ago, when I first started pastoring out in Texas, uh, I would be so nervous on days like this because we've worked and we've prayed and we've planned. And then I'm like, what if it doesn't go right? And what if it doesn't go and this and that and the other? And uh, several years ago, uh, the Lord just gave me a great peace where we've done all we know to do. We've prayed, we've planned, we've prepared, we've decorated, and I am going to enjoy the fire out of myself this week. Now, whether you do or not, I'm going to have a great week because I believe with all my heart this is a make or break week for our church. Uh, I believe either God's going to blow us up and go forward or we're going to blow up and go all over the place. But one way or the other, we're blowing up this week. Amen? And I'm excited about that. I believe that God wants to do something in this city, uh, in this place, at this time, not only here but around the world. And we're excited about our missions revival and uh, really excited to have our dear friend, Dr. John Jenkins, with us. And I'm going to let him introduce his whole family. They're here on vacation, just worked out where he could be here to kick off our meeting. And, uh, you know, years ago, we were going into conference revival at our church in Texas, and one of my favorite people in the whole world came up and said, man, I'm so excited about revival. And I said, really, why? They said, because we finally get to hear some good preaching. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, I've matured, and I've got past that, and I've grown, and that, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me. And one of our men came up to me and they said, preacher, so glad Brother Jenkins is here. We're going to hear some content in our preaching this morning. So, you know, I love you, and may God have mercy on your soul, all right? But uh, what a blessing. We're going to have a great day. Dr. Jenkins, literally, uh, Val and I would agree, probably one of our two or three uh, favorite living preachers. Love to hear him preach the Bible. He's, just a, he's a Bible preacher, and uh, you'll enjoy John this morning. All the way from Gaylord, Michigan. How many Michiganders do we have? All right, he's one of you folks, all right? And uh, so, uh, y'all can relate and talk Yankee to each other. Okay, uh, do we have anybody first time or first time in a very long time here at Community? I'm, I've met several of this morning, so thrilled you're here, but this is your first time or first time in a long time. I want to welcome you and thank you. I want to give you a visitor pack, and then after the service, if you'll come and meet me here up front, I've got a gift for you, and I just want to thank you, but would you slip your hand up, let one of our ushers find you. Good to have some folks here, and boy, got a good group of friends here. Thank you folks for being here. Some others back here, honored to have you. Folks back over here, God bless you folks. We're so glad that you're here. And it's, it's good to have Carl home. And many of us have been praying for Carl and the family. His mother passed away this week, went up to Ohio. And while it was a difficult thing, it was also a blessing. A couple of things. Number one, first time uh, in their, their adult life that all seven brothers were together. And uh, they got to fellowship. But here's the cooler thing. Uh, Carl's son brought the message for his grandmother. And he got up and said, Grandma wanted the gospel preached at her service. And uh, Carl's son, who pastors up in Ocala, Florida, preached his grandmother's message this, mo this week uh, in her home. Going, glad to have you home, Carl. Been praying for you, Barbara. Been praying for you as well. And uh, your families, God bless you folks. And uh, others, we're so thrilled you're here and what God can do for you. Want to go to the Lord in prayer? And uh, David, you make your way to the platform, please. David Hall uh, is our missions uh, committee guy. He, he's been responsible much is what you're going to see in the next few days. Uh, he and his wife and our staff have been working on. But uh, I want David to open us in prayer. Let's remember a couple things. Uh, we mentioned the Doolittles, our missionaries in Brazil. That situation is not getting better. It's getting worse. And then we just got an email this morning. The uh, Boltz family, our missionaries in Guyana, they've had a terrible setback. And the government has become... Uh, a roadblock now, and they're even staying in the country. And so he sent out an urgent prayer request that a problem would be fixed or else they have 30 days to vacate the country. Now, listen, let me explain this to you. Spent three years on deputation. Been on the field three months, and they have 30 days to either get the problem fixed or get home. Uh, God's not going to, uh, listen, we didn't, he, they didn't waste all that time and money to be kicked off. Let's pray God would do something in that and solve that situation uh, for the Bolts family, all right? And then other prayer requests, uh, Melda Henry, uh, Harry, uh, who else was in the hospital this week? Uh, oh, uh, Brother uh, Lance is here. Uh, Brother uh, Brother Willard Lance. Brother Willard Lance is back this morning and uh, in good shape. So we rejoice been praying for him and uh, others that have been in the hospital and going through some things. David, you come pray for us, then we'll get, let the choir come down. Let's pray. Father, it's a privilege and a joy to be in your house tonight, today, this morning, and we just uh, desperately need you, Lord. Amen. 
We pray that the Spirit of God would come upon this place, each, every one in here. Every believer in Christ would examine their heart to make sure they are sanctified, they're walking in the fear of God and the love of Jesus Christ. And Father, for those who are not here, who are here that don't know Christ, we pray this be the day of their conversion, that they would pass from death into life and realize the joy and the peace of Christ. And Lord, we ask God just for these missionaries, the bolts and the uh, Doolittle, please, uh, Lord, intervene in their behalf and please bless them. And Lord, uh, defeat the counsel of the adversary and Lord, for your glory and honor. We, we thank you for uh, Dr. Jenkins being with us. We pray that you'd use him greatly. Lord, you know this message that this church needs, so we're praying today that your messenger would deliver it and that, Lord, we would respond. We just prayed through this week that, uh, Lord, that we would focus on missions and realizing our part in the great commission, Lord God, is to go in all the world and preach the gospel, and, Lord, your people's hearts would be tender and softened, and, Lord God, that your, your will would be done and that you would bring, uh, be glorified and honored through all this, and we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I want you to go find somebody that you don't recognize, a new face to you. Greet them this morning. Going to let the choir come down. God bless you. We're glad you're here. Let's take our songbooks number 101. We have a story to tell to the nation. Sing it with me. Ready? We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their heart to the right. A story of truth and mercy. A story of peace and right. A story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn. Show. 
And sing a couple choruses with me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, a good chorus as we get started into this week. Sing it with me. Ready? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Whoops. <laughs> Try the right key. Actually, sing it a cappella. You know what? Just give me a chord, Jess. Let's, that sounded really good. Give us just a chord. Sing it with Jessica is just coming back from a car accident, and it is great to have her back at the piano this week. She's been gone the last couple months, and so she has a terrible shoulder injury, and it's great to have her back this morning. So give her a little bit of a break if she's a little, uh, a little rusty in her right shoulder. Drugs are our friend, amen? But you know what? You gave me a great idea. Give us just a chord, because they're singing really good this morning. Give us that first chord. Ready? Ready? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for Try it again. Ready? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. For you, amen. Try one more with me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. It's number 110 in your songbooks. Let's try it. Ready? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. The last several weeks we've been trying to prepare our hearts for this week. And, uh, you know, missions is about the heart. It is about what God's called us to do. And, uh, you know, God will have all of you if he has your heart. I want you to just take a few moments this morning. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to the video screens and the uh, side wings are here in the front. And I want to remind you about what our calling and our responsibility as Christians uh, really is as we enter now into our missions conference week. Gentlemen, help us.
going to introduce you to the gospel right now. You are a rebel. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, I'll tell you straight up. You are a rebel against the living God. This is your natural disposition. Why? Because you were born in sin. We are in a prison cell. And it takes the awakening and the grace of God, you call it the provenient grace of God, to awaken us to the fact that we are lost and we can't get out. We're headed towards destruction fast. The enemy, because of our rebellion against God, has legal rights to harm and harass our life. There you are behind the prison cell. Help! I need out! You can't get out. Those prison bars are stronger than any adamant. There is no way you can cut them because they're stronger than diamond. It is impenetrable. You cannot escape. You're doomed. Because when the enemy comes in in the very end, and he's going to finish you off. Because he has legal right to do it. And he's going to relish every minute of it. In strolls your intercessor. that accuser and he takes the hit that was rightfully yours he takes the blow that was intended for you that is an extraordinary reality that he was turned to a pulp and he actually died god died for you over your prison cell it has always said condemned separated eternally from god guilty and then suddenly it switches when you realize what Jesus Christ has done, it says justified. It says forgiven, redeemed. Here's the problem. Most of us have stopped with the good news right there. The blood of Jesus Christ has been shed and he was killed. Now I want you to know that is unbelievable news. But we are still in a prison cell. And so we're praising God from within a prison cell going, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for changing the sign on the outside of the prison. And God's word says, could you check the door to the prison cell? Because my blood was shed for more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness was the avenue. persecute you they will do whatever they can to harm you i'm in 
I'll do it, God. I don't care. You shed your blood for me. I would gladly shed my blood for you. Take my body. Take my blood. Spend it any way you want. I belong to you in, in covenant. Take me, Lord Jesus. Send me the commission, not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son and a daughter of the king. And he says, I ask you to go. Go and make disciples of all men. Go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it. Go, rescue the lost in the power of my name. For it's not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. I'll go. And as you're beginning to head out with his blessing, he says, hold it. Wait, there's one more thing. Not just the penalty. Not just the problem. Not just the invitation to his very near presence. Not just the adoption as a son or a daughter of the king and not just the commission. This is the capstone. If you think that is all good, you could wrap that all up into one ball and it still falls short of the final one. Because this final one is so condescending on the part of our king. It is so bewildering. It is so extraordinary. so amazing. And this is the truth that turns the world upside down. Before you go. What I'm sending you out to do is impossible. I know. Impossible. And if you do it in your own strength, you'll fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. And if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make it my home. And I will take those hands of yours and make them my hands. I will take those feet of yours and make them my feet. I will take that mouth of yours and it will speak my words. I will take those eyes of yours and they can now see what I need you to be seen in this world. And I will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh so that it will beat with my burdens. And you will care for the very things that I care about. And your prayers will become my prayers. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. the living God Almighty, the consuming, almighty, sovereign God dwells within his children. And as we stand and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority in the name of Jesus and we will not back down because we do not head off to war to lose. We head off to war to win. Our God marks all the powers of earth and hell through fluffy little lambs because his lambs beat the wolf pack. That's the gospel. The gospel trounces upon Peace to fill you. Because if you try and imitate your own strength,
strength, you will be a miserable replica. But if you allow the impartation of Jesus Christ to overtake you, suddenly it all works. Because it's him imitating himself. And he's very good at being God. Take your Bibles and get ready for a great preacher, a good man, good friend. We've come to the place at community where I'm getting to know you and you're getting to know me. And we've been together for three years. And we've come to the place where we're going to go forward for God. Uh, we are in the greatest business in the world. And those that, that don't understand that will not enjoy that that not enjoy our, our idea here. Our idea is to serve the Lord. Our idea is to go forward in missions and getting the gospel out. There's a lot of churches, a lot of churches that have better programs or materials or things, but that's not what we're going to be interested in. It's preaching the word of God, trying to help people. I don't know a better preacher than John Jenkins. John, you come preach for us.
that's got to be one of the handsomest preacher's kids in all of America. Amen. <laughs> Good to see you, Grant. Amen. Amen. I preached for Brother Stancil in uh, Texas several times, and one of those times, Grant was wearing his cowboy boots and his cowboy hat. I think he was maybe four at the time, maybe three, three or four. And uh, we decided to go golfing uh, one day while we were there. And uh, Miss Valerie, the uh, uh, I think, had something she had to do. And the preacher said, do you mind if Grant goes golfing with us? And I said, that'd be great. I'd like to spend a day with Grant. And we were out on the golf course. And, of course, Grant wasn't golfing. He just he just riding in the cart with us. I think he drove a little bit. And uh, the uh, while well, we got out there, and it was winter time, and the course wasn't in real good shape. And uh, Brother Stancil said, don't worry, at least we get to golf, amen. There's snow on the ground in Michigan. And uh, so we got out there golfing, and uh, we lost sight of Grant. And uh, I saw him in over one of the sand traps, and I looked over in the sand trap, and he was in the sand trap making uh, uh, the uh, snow angels, amen. The, uh, if you're not a golfer, you're not supposed to mess up the sand traps. And uh, Brother Stancil said, get out of there, Grant. And I said, you know what, preacher, this course is in a mess anyway. I said, we'll never forget the day that Grant made snow angels in the sand traps, amen. I think every sand trap on that course had a snow angel from Grant, uh, the uh, stencil in it, amen. The, uh, he got that uh, personality from his mother, amen. No, 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 no. The, uh, I think we know who gave him that crazy personality, no, amen. The, uh, would you grab your Bible real quick and stand with me this morning as we turn to Matthew 13. I'd like to take just a moment and read a couple verses. And uh, let's show respect to the Word of God as we read. And also find a second place, if you would. I'd like you to find Luke's Gospel, chapter 16 today. Uh, I am honored to be here. It's a thrill and joy to be with my dear friend, uh, Brother Stancil. The, uh, we go back many years, and uh, what a great uh, testimony that he had in Texas. And how I'm thrilled that God brought him here to Community Baptist Church. What a great, great thing to have him here at Community Bible Baptist in uh, St. Pete. That's where we're at today, is it, Brother Stancil? Yes, sir. We're in Saint. There you are, Brother Stancil. See, I think we're in St. Pete. Amen. Uh, my family's with me. Brother Stancil the, uh, invited us to be a part of today here. We're uh, vacationing for the week down in uh, uh, Fort Charlotte. And uh, what a thrill to get up here. I told the family we had to get up early this morning and get up here. So we left. We got up the, or got uh, on the road about 8 o'clock. And we got here early enough to stop and go to the Bob Evans for breakfast. Amen. The, uh, it wasn't as far as we thought it was. But it is an honor to be here. Uh, I'm from northern Michigan. I know I sound like I'm from the south. And that's because I was raised in the mountains of Kentucky. And uh, the, uh, so the, uh, if you got a little, any hillbillies here this day? Any hillbillies here? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. A few hillbillies. I met a few Michigan folks here today as well, and they might be worse hillbillies than the folks from uh, of the South, but uh, it is an honor to be here today, and I want to just take a few moments this morning and try to help you get kicked off with your missions revival and missions conference. Simple thought I want to leave with you. Look at verse 44 of Matthew 13, then we're going to turn to Luke 16 in just a moment. One verse here in Matthew 13, notice the Bible says, Again, the kingdom of heaven, I'd like you to read a word with me in a moment together in unison. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, say it with me out loud, church, treasure, hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. I want to focus your thought today. I'm not going to preach about money. But I want to focus your thought today on that word, treasure. Everybody in this room this morning has something that you consider a treasure. Matter of fact, Jesus made the statement where a man's treasure is, there will his what? Heart be also. Now flip over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, if you will, quickly, and pick up with me verse number 19. I'll begin reading. The Bible says in verse 19, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. 
The rich man, the Bible says, also died and was buried. Maybe the saddest verse in all the Bibles, the next verse in your Bible this morning. It says, and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Folks, the reason we got to get involved in missions is because this is a true story. Amen. Some Bible commentators tell us that the story of Lazarus and the rich man is just a parable. That the fire and the uh, real description of a fiery hell in this passage is just figurative. But my friend, if it is a parable, it's the only parable in the Bible that uses proper names. It's not a parable, it's a true story. Verse 27, and he said, listen to what the rich man in hell prayed. Do you know folks in hell are praying this morning? I preached years ago a sermon, I, the title offended a few people, but I titled it One Hell of a Church. And I described the things they're doing in hell we need to be doing in church. One of the things they're doing in hell this morning and a lot of Christians need to get fired up about is they pray in hell. They care about the lost in hell. Are you all thinking like I am this morning? Look at verse 27. He said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Verse 28 is our text this morning. For I have five, what's the next word, church? Brethren. Brethren. Would you let me interject a thought here? We just found out what his treasure is. Because with only one request, he said, my one concern today is the spiritual destination, the eternal fate of my brethren. But notice the words that he gets from Abraham. Abraham saith unto him in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, nay, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, if they will hear not Moses and the prophets, that means the Old Testament scripture, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Would you be seated for a moment this morning? For just a few minutes this morning, I want to ask you this morning about your treasure. Accidents can happen at any time. Just two and a half years ago, our church had just an unimaginable accident take place. Four of the finest Christian young men you've ever met. One, a 25-year-old graduate of our college, Grace Baptist College, a tremendous Christian man. Just married a couple of years, his wife pregnant with their first precious little baby. And three teenage young men, one a graduate of our Christian school, headed to Bible college, the other two, uh, the seniors, upcoming their senior year coming that fall, working for that 25-year-old man on their way home from work on a Thursday afternoon. Someone was text messaging on their phone, at least that's what we think happened. Crossed the middle line, and when he did, he took out the front left tire of a semi, and that semi crossed the line, and head on that pickup truck those four young men were driving in. And I mean, folks, in a matter of moments, three of them were immediately in eternity. And seven or eight, ten hours later, the other was also in eternity. I've had a lot of funerals, Brother Stancil, in my 26 years of pastoring Grace Baptist Church in Gaylor, Michigan, but none ever like that one. When there were four caskets across the front of the auditorium over a... 1,600 people crammed into our building in every classroom and every hallway watching on closed circuit, I think seven or eight closed circuit televisions. The sanctuary uh, jammed to the gills as we buried four young men in one day, the oldest 25 years of age. Can I remind you this morning you don't got to be old to die? Can I remind you, my friend, this morning that, listen, life is not in our hands. Accidents in life cause all of us to really think about what's important. 
That's why Solomon said it's better, he said, to go to the house of mourning than he is, he said, to be a guest at a feast. To paraphrase that in our vernacular, he said it's better to go to funerals than it is to parties. All of us would rather be invited to a party, but parties do us far less good than funerals do. Because funerals make us all think about what's really important. Funerals cause us to think about forever. Brother Stansel mentioned to me this morning about this pastor in this area whose daughter was just tragically killed in church. Boy, you want to talk about thinking about what's important. You say, Brother Jenkins, what are you, what's on your mind this morning? I know you've probably never connected Matthew 13, 44 about a man finding treasure in a field and the story of the rich man and Lazarus. But I want to try quickly to draw a couple truths out of this story of the rich man and Lazarus that I think will help us all this morning think about where our treasures really should be this morning. Let me begin this morning by making one of three statements. Statement number one, you cannot salvage things once life is over. So you need to share those things now. Everybody's saving for a rainy day. Well, it's raining, neighbor. It may not be raining outside, but it's raining all over this world this morning. There are people this morning that need something. And over the next five days, Community Bible Baptist Church is going to be asked to do something about that need. You say, well, Brother Jenkins, I just can't afford to be involved in missions. Can I ask you, can you afford not to be involved in missions? And I'm not just talking about your wallet. I'm talking about your schedule. You say, but Brother Jenkins, I'm retired. Retired people got more time to serve God than they've ever had at any point in their life. I actually had Brother Gibbs, a man in our church a few years ago, tell me that he felt like God wanted him to retire. And he said, I think I can retire. And he was in his late 50s. He'd done very well for himself, owned his own business, owned a, a beautiful second home, had his cars paid for, motorcycles, boats, had it all. And he said, I j- just, he said, I don't need to work any longer. And I said, I don't think you ought to retire. He said, why is that, preacher? And I said, you're too young to retire. You're, go- you're not going to spiritually make it if you, if you jump out this early. He said, but preacher, I don't need any more money. I said, well, you don't need any more money? He said, I got all my bills paid, got everything paid off. He said, I I really don't need to work any longer. And I said, why don't you work 10 more years and give it all to missions? Or get in the ministry full time. I can't imagine anything else that would be the will of God for you. You know what, Brother Samson, he didn't retire, and I don't think he gave it all to missions either. Amen. Amen. I said, you cannot salvage things once life is over. Share things now. Can I beg you, my dear friend, to hear this thought this morning? Do not treasure things, treasure people. Think about the rich man this morning. He's engrossed in his wealth, but he made the mistake of focusing only on the here and now. Only upon this world, and listen, friend, he was preoccupied with things, and he left every single one of those things behind. You may have never noticed this, but hearses do not have trailer hitches on them. You've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. And the reason is things, not most of them, not much, every single thing you've got this morning, you're going to leave behind when you leave this world. The rich man, we're told, was clothed in purple and fine linen. The Bible says he fared sumptuously. Not some days, not most days, but the Bible says every day he lived in luxury. I see in this passage a man who took pride in his wealth. A man whose riches were his God. His only concern was how grand of a house he lived in. His only concern was that he could eat the best food. Wear the finest clothes. Throw the biggest parties in town. Is it not sad this morning that he invested his whole life in things that he had to leave behind? Do you know what's amazing about this, Dr. Stancil? God gave the rich man a chance to change. 
say, I, I don't see that in the textbook of Jenkins. Oh, no, no, you're, you're reading too fast. Right out in front of his house, which he had to stare at every single day, he left home and went wherever he was planning to go, was a beggar who could have been sent to a doctor, who could have maybe been put in a hospital, who could have been maybe put in a rehab somewhere and given a second chance at life. But instead of getting help from this rich man, the only comfort that Lazarus ever knew was the tongue of a dog licking at his sores. I know we may not have a beggar that lives outside of our house this morning, but I wonder who you and I drive past every day with not even the slightest concern about where they're going or where they'll spend eternity. Worrying about the economy. It amazes me how many people have not lost their job, their pension hasn't been affected, and they won't give because they're worried about the economy. Brother Jenkins, you never know what's going to happen. Haven't you seen a show on TV about orders and, you know, folks that are doomsday prepared? Yeah, and they're all nuts. <laughs> Don't you think we ought to prepare? Hey, listen, friend, I'm waiting for the trumpet to sound. I ain't building a bomb shelter. And for you that are, I know you're a good Christian, and if it really gets desperate, you let us all stay at your place. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Have full confidence in your religion. Amen. I'm thinking of a story. The great Dr. George W. Truett. What a man of God Dr. Truett was. You talk about an amazing story. George W. Truett pastored the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, he is the man who followed him, Dr. W.A. Criswell, pastored it for another number of decades. Those two men together, back to back, pastored that church for over a century. Amen. They say that church in its glory years was the, was the flagship of the Southern Baptist Convention. No wonder that great church touched the world, had two pastors in a hundred years. Dr. Truett pastored it almost 60 himself. One day, Dr. Truett was invited to the home of a wealthy Texas oil man, a man that Dr. Truett wanted to see saved. And so Dr. Truett accepted the invitation. He and his wife went to that oil man's beautiful, I mean, it was a Texas ranch like you've never seen. After a, just an exquisite dinner, the wealthy oil man invited Dr. Truett out, and they jumped in a truck and drove to a high bluff and looked every direction. And he wanted him to see his property and his holdings. He said, uh, preacher, I want to tell you what, what I've been able to accomplish with my life. He said, 25 years ago, I didn't have a dime. He said, I was broke. He said, just take a beautiful 360, preacher. He said, everywhere you look, he said, I own every bit of it. He pointed to the east, and uh, uh, just as far as the eye could see, oh, Derek's dotted the sky of the, uh, of the landscape, and he said, I own everything you see in that direction, sir. He turned to the other direction, the opposite side of his, their vantage point. He said, look at those beautiful fields of grain as far as you can see over the horizon. He said, I own all of that as well. He pointed into the north and as far as the eye could see were fields loaded with literally thousands upon thousands of cattle. He said, I own all of that too. He said, if you look back this direction, he said, all you can see, as far as you can see, is field after field of forest and trees. He said, I own all that as well. He said, every direction you look, he said, I own it all. Pretty proud of himself. He didn't realize who he had in his midst. About that time, the great old man of God, Dr. Truett, put his arm around that wealthy man, and he said, sir, my concern is how much do you got in that direction? The simple truth is this morning a lot of us have got more than we need in this life and thank God he's been good to us. But the question I want to ask you this morning, my friend, is how much do you have in that direction? I said, my dear friend, you cannot salvage things once life is over. Share them now. My good friend, Dr. Russell Anderson, multimillionaire, gave the last report, Dr. Anderson told me he's given over $38 million to the work of God. Dr. Anderson could be living in luxury beyond description today. 
And over the last decade, his goal has been to give away every dollar he's got. He said, I want to die broke. I stayed four or five times, me and my wife, in Unit 600, the only condominium unit on Waikiki Beach in Honolulu, Hawaii. Sixth floor overlooks the beach. Dr. Anderson said you could throw a biscuit and hit the water, and you really can. I've tried it. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous two-bedroom condominium lanai the whole length of the building. I mean, right there next to Dorsey Park where Hilton Hawaiian Village is that direction, and you diamond head that way. I mean, just who wouldn't want? I mean, we're talking a piece, just that condo worth about $3.5 million. He owned 10 units in that building at one time. He now still has one little old apartment over there, Brother Stancil. It's five or six blocks off the ocean. I don't even think it's got a water view anymore because he just slowly gave away every one of them. Send 100000 here, 200000 to this Bible college, a half a million to this mission project. He told me when he finally sold the last unit, Unit 600, he said, Brother Jenkins, I didn't even buy a cup of coffee with it. He said, I cashed a check and sent it straight to the Philippines. He said, Russell Anderson's fingers are clean. There may not be a multimillionaire in this room this morning, but I ask you, what are you holding on to this morning that you need to get involved in the work of God with? I said, you cannot, my friend. Listen, you cannot salvage things once life is over, so share them now. Quickly, let me say, secondly, this morning, you cannot seize opportunities once life is over. So seek God now. We sang just a little bit ago, make me a sanctuary. Did you sing that or did you pray that? Was that just Sunday morning worship or was that really what's going on inside of your heart this morning as you think about this need of world missions? You know, if we're not careful, we think we got it tomorrow. One of these days we're going to get serious for God. One of these days we're going to do something for Jesus. But my friend, one of these days may not be another day. Someone wiser than I said, if not here, where? If not now, when? If not me, who? A number of years ago there was a geologist that got his truck actually a jeep kind of a vehicle stuck in a riverbed as he was in the back country of Tanzania his name was Dr. Williamson and when he got out of his jeep and saw how stuck he was in that little riverbed he went out and got in his shovel and began to dig trying to get his vehicle unstuck disappointed and upset the rain had uh, uh, just fallen over the few days before he'd gotten there and that riverbed was once dry was now a muddy morass and as he was trying to dig his jeep out and trying to get out of that mud uh, that his vehicle was stuck in his his shovel hit something and he again tried to dig out and he realized that he was hitting something fairly large and as he began to dig the dirt around it he reached down and that little stone about the size of a quarter it was not just any ordinary rock. He began to wipe it off and he realized it was something valuable and my did he have any idea, no he did not, what he had just found in that riverbed in Tanzania. You ladies will appreciate this. That day what Dr. Williamson discovered was the world famous pink Tanzania diamond. Over 26 carats. Back then worth over $7 million. He found it with a shovel digging a jeep out of a riverbed. By the way, if you'd like to see the Tanzania pink diamond, it's still in existence today. Hard to get through it though. It's in the Tower of London and it's actually in Queen Elizabeth's scepter. Last time it was out in public was when she was coronated after the death of her father almost 60 years ago. I got thinking about that story when I discovered it a while back, Brother Sansel, and I thought about this. 
if you and I will do our best to try to help people who are stuck in this world's mud, if we'll get out of our vehicle and get our shovel and get dirty and get a little sweat and perspiration on our brow, you and I will be amazed that the treasures we'll find buried in this world's muck and mire. That's why we have the RU. That's why we run the Sunday school buses. That's why we send people across the world to win the world with the gospel of Christ because we're searching for real treasure. I said you cannot share things or salvage things once this life is over, so you better share them now. I said, listen, folks, you cannot seize opportunities once this life is over. So if you're ever planning on seeking God, you better seek him this morning. Can I give you a last thought as I think about this request of the rich man? My friend, well, you and I cannot save others once life is over. Did you hear what I said? We cannot save others once this life is over. So we better speak up now. Is it not interesting that the rich man did not get burdened about his family member's plight until he himself was in hell? He had a burden, and thank God his heart was beating. Thank God there was a tear in the corner of his eye for his brothers. But hey, listen, listen, rich man, you waited one day too late to get concerned. The thoughts of this rich man ought to break every one of our hearts this morning. I think, Brother Stancil, of my own mother this morning, my mom... My dad are on their 55th, just soon to be here, 56th year marriage. My dad started pastoring his first church and he was 19 years old, wasn't even married yet. He's 80 here in a couple of days. Dad will have been in the ministry here in a couple of days, 61 years. My dad grew up in southern Michigan in a little little country town called Grass Lake, Michigan. His dad was a dairy farmer. My mother, her dad was a union steward at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Jackson, Michigan. They only grew up a few miles apart, but their worlds were hundreds of miles apart. Dad grew up on a dairy farm, but dad also grew up in a very godly, very godly, born-again Christian family. My great-grandfather, Jesse Nathaniel Jenkins, got ordained to preach the gospel in 1906. One of his sons, my Uncle Lyndon, died when the communists overtook China as a missionary with Hudson Taylor's great mission work to China and Inland Mission. My own father's a preacher. His brother-in-law, one of his brothers is a preacher. I'm a preacher. My son John, who's here this morning, is a preacher. John's actually the fifth generation in a row of independent Baptist preacher in our family. That's the heritage of my dad's side of the family. My grandmother, Gladys Jenkins. Well, Stancil, she was a junior high, eighth grade girl Sunday school teacher for 51 years in the same department, in the same class, in the same church, the Sycamore Baptist Church in Jackson, Michigan. 51 years taught the same Sunday school class. That's my definition of a faithful Sunday school teacher. But my mom's family, they were hardworking people, but they were drunkards. My mom was a bus kid, if you can believe that. My mom got picked up in the late 1940s by an old Sunday school bus and took her to church when she was 13 years of age. Dad grew up in a family full of preachers and great heritage. Mom, to our knowledge, my mom was the first saved person in her family that any of us know anything about. No grandparents, uncles, aunts, nobody that was saved. Just absolute unchurched heathen people. Hard working, good ethics when it came to work, but just 
drinkers and smokers and ungodly people. That's my mom's heritage. My mom and dad, I won't tell the whole story, ended up getting together and got married and entered the ministry together and went to Bible college. My dad went to the same college Brother Stansel did, Midwestern Baptist College. My dad had a burden for his father-in-law. My father-in-law was a, was a good man in the sense that he was a hard worker, respected by his neighbors, but just a lost man, a pretty rough one at that. My dad had several times tried to win my grandfather to Christ, and every time he did, my grandfather stiff armed him and was very, very, very unpleasant about the effort to give him the gospel. One Sunday night, my dad got done preaching. He preached that night about winning people to Christ and was so burdened, so heartsick about his own father-in-law that he got in his vehicle after church on a Sunday night and drove nearly an hour. That little old crossroads called Lenaway, Michigan on old US-12 between Jackson and Grass Lake. Pulled into the driveway. It was nearly 9.30 when Dad got there. My grandfather, Maynard, said my dad's name was Howard, but somehow he got a nickname, Bill. And my grandfather said, Bill, what are you doing here tonight? And he said, Dad, I need to talk to you. And sitting there at the kitchen table with a Pabst Blue Ribbon beer can opened up on the table, my dad tried to tell my grandfather that he didn't want him to go to hell. He wanted him to get saved. My grandfather looked my dad in the eye and he said, Bill, you listen to me and you listen to me well. He said, I don't want you to ever talk to me about Jesus Christ again. He said, I'll get, I'll get religion when I get ready. And he said, until then, you can shove it. And basically, basically threw my dad off the property. My dad got in his vehicle and with a broken heart drove back home that night with no idea how events would transpire in just a few short hours. On Monday evening, my grandfather got a terrible nosebleed. I mean, it, I mean, bled for several hours. Not sure what it meant. He told my grandmother that he'd go to the doctor if there was any more problems, but he had to get to work. It was Tuesday morning. My grandmother got in the car with my grandfather and took him to work that morning. She needed the vehicle. Brother Gibbs, they were only a few miles from their house headed towards Jackson, Goodyear and Tire Rubber Company, where my grandpa was a union steward. When he slumped over the steering wheel, my grandmother grabbed the wheel and pulled it into a gas station. A blood clot had hit my grandfather's heart. And at 47 years of age, Maynard Bunn slipped out into eternity faster than he could take a breath. Folks, that was 1964. You do the math. My grandfather's been in hell now for almost 50 years. For almost 50 years now, my grandfather father's been falling. He has been screaming. He has been dealing with that worm that dieth not. He has been dealing with the horrors of that dark place of the abyss. And as tragedy, and as, as tragic as it is, that that's where he is. I'm sure glad, Brother Stanson, my dad got out of his comfort zone that Sunday night and wait, made one more trip to Leone, Michigan and tried to tell Maynard Bunn that there was a hell to miss and a heaven to get in. He said, but Brother Jenkins, I've tried before and I'm afraid that I'll offend. Hey, listen, friend, it doesn't matter if we offend our loved ones. Listen, friend, one day in hell is too many. Some of us just need to take one more chance. Maybe at the very minimum to put a gospel track in a letter and a strong appeal to someone you love. I said you cannot save others once life is over. So you better speak up now. Back when our country was in the middle of the Vietnam War, A young American hero who'd given a tour in Vietnam for his country finally arrived back in the United States and his parents, of course, not even aware yet that he was on his way home, were just overjoyed when the phone rang and on the other end was their son's voice. 
He said, Mom and Dad, I'm home. Oh, they were thrilled. Her tears streamed down her cheeks when they heard his voice. And he said, Mom and Dad, I made it out of Vietnam alive. I'm on my way home. Oh, they just couldn't. They just couldn't contain their thrill. They couldn't wait to see their boy. Right before the phone hung up and he explained to his parents he'd be home in a couple of days, he said, Dad, can I ask you a favor? He said, well, sure, son, anything for our son. What do you need, son? He said, Dad, I got a friend. A guy I met here in Vietnam. I'd like to bring home with me. He said, what? Well, any friend of your son's a friend of ours. Absolutely. Bring him with you. Bring him with you. He said, but dad, be, be, before, I, before I hang up, let me tell you about him. He said, dad, he stepped on a landmine. Dad, he said, one of his legs got blown off. He said, dad, in that explosion, not only did he, one of his legs get blown off, but he said his arm got blown off also. He's daddy's a good guy. He won't cause any trouble. But he said, Dad, he's be, he broke up pretty bad. He said, Dad, is it still okay if I bring him home? There's a pause on the other end of the phone for just a few moments. And here's what his dad said, something like this. He said, Son, he said, Well, someone that, that tore up son with those kind of handicaps would need a lot of extra care, son. He said, Mom and I are retired, and man, we're, we're, living, we're living our golden years. He said, Son, it's not that we don't care. He said, My, how we respect what that young man did for his country. He said, Son, I could never ask your mom to inconvenience yourself to take care of someone that needy. He said, Son, it's not that we don't care. He said, I'm sure he's a great guy. He said, I, I just think that'd be more than Mom and I could be responsible for. Dad kept talking, but it took him a few moments before he realized that the phone had gone dead on the other end. He was really puzzled. He was really, he tried to call back and there was no call, no, 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 no response. Three days later, that same father got another phone call from the San Francisco Police Department. And they said, um, called their names and it was them and called their son's name and yes, were his parents, and they said, well, we found his body. It appears that he jumped off the top of a balcony of a motel, and when he hit the ground, he was instantly killed. We need you to come and let us know for sure if it's your son. Their hearts were devastated. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. They jumped in the, uh, the uh, uh, car and ran to the airport and got on a plane and flew straight to San Francisco. They were taken by the police to the county morgue where their son's body was being kept for their examination. Well, Stancil, when they opened the door and pulled out the body, both of their hearts stopped beating. When they noticed their son's right leg was gone and his right arm was missing. He wasn't asking for a friend to come home. He was telling them the shape their son was going to be in when he got home. If we're not careful, the only burdens we have are for people we know. But my friend, all over this world this morning are millions of untold people who have never heard the simple truth that Jesus loves them. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. What do you treasure this morning? I said, what do you treasure this morning? Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to turn the service over in just a moment to our pastor. But I would ask you, my dear precious friend this morning, to think about the treasures in your life and what priorities they reveal about you. Absolutely, no question. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Rebecca's going to begin to play. Keith's coming. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as Savior, could I plead with you that God has moved literally heaven and earth to get you here this morning so that you could make a decision to receive Christ? Don't go another moment 
not knowing. And we would never try to intimidate, scare, pressure, push, but you really don't know what your life is. You don't have to be old to die. And once you die, you're in eternity, and there's no, no change after that. With every head bowed, every eyes closed, can I ask you this simple question? Preacher, if I died right now, I mean just right now, heart attack, stroke, car wreck before you got home. Preacher, I do not know that I would go to heaven. I just don't know that. And you'd say, Preacher, would you just pray for me? I, nobody's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to come to you. But, you. but you've heard Brother Jenkins this morning, and he's explained that that rich man was fine day one, but day two he was in eternity. And that could be you this morning. You say, Pastor, if I were to die right now, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Would you simply do this? Slip your hand up. Put it right back down. Let me pray for you all over this building. Just slide it up. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. What about you? So, preacher, if I died right now, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. Just slip it up. Let me see it. Let me be able to pray for you. All over the building, front to back, left to right. If that's you, you raised your hand in just a moment. Keith will begin to sing. Our folks will begin to move, and you step out of your place, and I'll meet you somewhere here at the front. We'll take a Bible, and from God's Word, not, not something we made up, not something man devised, but God's Word will show you what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, to know you'd go to heaven. Why don't you step out and meet me here? And let us take a Bible and show you what it means to be forever sure you're saved. Second question is along the lines of if you also were to die today, heart attack, stroke, car wreck, do you have treasure up there? You know, God doesn't look at down here as much as he looks at up there. What, what have you in heaven? You say, preacher, I, I have a lot. Praise the Lord. Preacher, I don't have a lot. Listen, now's a great day and a great week to say, I want to start laying up treasure that really matters where death doesn't take from. Say, so, preacher, you know, to be honest, I've been a little more concerned with my treasure here than up there. Would you just slip your hand up and let me pray with you all over the building just a moment. God bless you and you. God bless you. God bless you. God wants to do something this week. Will you let him? You've been confronted this morning with the great question, where is your treasure? I don't want that thought to leave you all week long. Where is your treasure? What's really, really important to you? You raise your hand. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you need to step out of your place and come. Folks will be here, want to help you, want to do all we can to be a blessing to you. I'm going to have a word of prayer, then Keith's going to begin to sing. Why don't you step out of your place and come? Father, please, this morning, I know there's several that need to be saved. They've raised their hands. They've identified that. Lord, others need to make decisions. Others need to surrender areas of their life. Lord, I just pray that you'd begin a work this morning that would forever change our people and change our church. Please do a great work by saving the lost and helping the saved to see the need of the lost. We pray it now and we ask it in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. If you raise your hand, why don't you step out of your place and come? Keith begins to sing. You step out. You come. You raise your hand. You come. You raise your hand. You come. Need to be saved. You come. Laying up treasure in heaven. What, what's important to you? This week will reveal a lot of what's important to you. saved. If I died right now, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. The Bible says you can know. Why don't you step out of your place and come? It's not that hard. You make the first step. I promise the rest will be easy.
Christian, why don't you be praying? God, what do you have for me this week? What are you going to do in my life this week? Not, not everybody else, but me. Where once I burned with shame, grant my desire to magnify the Rebecca plays quietly. I'm going to give you one thought, and then we're going to close the service. Do you really believe that people in faraway lands that we consider third world or second world countries, developing countries, do you really believe that they're as important to Jesus Christ as your children are? I think we're so messed up in the American church that we think for some reason that, well, God's really concerned with us, but who cares about other nations, other people groups, other children? You understand that all over the world, there's seven billion people for whom Christ died. One of the great preachers of our past made this statement, why should we hear for a second time the gospel of Christ when most of the world has never heard the first time? That ought to burden us, that ought to break us, that ought to challenge us. I want that to be a thought in your mind. Do you realize that there are people who have never heard clearly what Christ has done for them? I say, preacher, man, that's a long service. You, you, listen, if that's your concern, you, you missed the point of this whole thing. If, if somebody will see what God could do with their life, that's our prayer. That's our hope this week. We'll close in prayer. We'll receive our offering, make a few announcements, be dismissed. But I don't want this message or this thought to leave your mind. Where is your treasure? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we close this portion of the service. And yet, Lord, I really believe that this is only the beginning, the opening. Add tonight to this morning and then tomorrow and so on down the week. So that by the same time next week, this church would be literally radically transformed into a gospel center, a gospel preaching place here in St. Pete and around the world. Bless the offering, the gift, the giver. Lord, may our money, our time, our hearts, our investment be for treasure above, not things here below. We pray, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, you come. And in just a moment, we have one of the coolest baptismal services we've ever had the privilege to have. Last Sunday, at the end of the service, a 90-year-old man came forward, and he said, you know, I've been in church all my life, but I've never been saved until today. He said, while you were preaching, he said, preacher, he said, God showed me that I don't have what you were talking about. Now, we visited Dave and I in the home this week, and He's been in church for years and years and years and years. He's taught. He's been involved. But he never had been converted 90 years of age. And last week with tears running down his eyes and again in his home this week, just excited about knowing for sure he's saved. And uh, he's going to get baptized this morning. Amen? And uh, so if you have an excuse, if you have an excuse of why you won't identify publicly with Christ, I got 90 reasons that you're wrong. Amen? And so just a moment, uh, Ted's going to be baptized. Brother Paul's going to have the privilege. I wish I could do it. I'm just afraid yet uh, to baptize, but I'm, uh, I'm a little jealous that Paul gets to do that. But we'll receive the offering. If you're a guest with us this morning, would you drop that visitor card in so we can have a record of your visit? Don't forget, at the end of the service, come down front, meet me, have a gift to give you. Thank you for being here. But this time, it's time for God's people to give back as the Lord has been so gracious to us, uh, and we give our tithes, our offerings, and our gifts. Father, bless the offering. Gift and giver now in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you as you give.
uh, we've been tickled all week. Dave and I just been having church, and it's also helped me. Every time I'm driving down the road, and I, I get angry at somebody from Canada going slow, I just say, Ted got saved, Ted got saved, Ted got saved, amen. But uh, hey, Snowbird, listen, that, this is what part of our mission field is reaching these folks, and uh, you pray for them, what a blessing. I know you're tickled, and uh, we're excited, amen. Uh, that'll help you, that'll help you. If you don't get help by that, there ain't no helping all right, uh, don't forget tonight we continue in Missions Revival, and tonight Tim Hawkins will be with us. If you think it's the Tim Hawkins that's funny, come. <laughs> if you think it's the Tim Hawkins that is assistant pastor down the road, come. But Tim Hawkins will be here tonight. I'm just not going to tell you which one till later, all right? And then uh, Brother Mark Forrest will be with us as well singing. And then many of you have asked about going into Haiti with us in April. Uh, we're going to have a meeting tonight about the Haiti trip. And uh, so we'll talk about that after the service. No Master Club this week. There will be WOW. Our buses will run. And uh, we'll have regular uh, WOW. No Master Club this week. Tomorrow, all day long, Tyrone Chick-fil-A, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Stop by Mention Community. And that'll help our school. And then don't forget Tuesday. Now, this is a great time. If you can snack off some time of work, 10 30 be here we have our missionaries we have food we have fellowship and it's going to be a great lunch uh 10 30 tuesday and then our big dinner saturday all week seven o'clock every night now listen i know that i'm not supposed to do this uh and and i want you here every night i want you here every night uh it's going to be great it's going to be a great week but you say preacher man i, I got to work schedule i got to work whatever i can only get one night can i please beg you if you can only get one night, I think it'll change your life if you can make it every night. But if you can only make one night, make it tomorrow night. Make it tomorrow night. Richard Wallace Jr. will be speaking tomorrow night. And he's going to speak on this subject. Hello, my name is Prodigal. Mm -hmm. Richard Wallace was a preacher's kid, is a preacher's kid. His father's one of my friends. And uh, Richard Wallace Jr. grew up in the same type home I did, same type home many of you did, went off and joined the Marine Corps. Somewhere along the way, got introduced to his first drugs. And from small drug use came a horrible addiction to methamphetamine. And if you know anything about drug addiction, meth is one of the hardest drugs to come off of and just a wrecker of lives. God did a miraculous, marvelous work. And now for the last five years, he has led one of the strongest RU chapters in the country, uh, reaching the hurting, the addicted. And you will not want to miss his message slash testimony Hello, my name is Prodigal. That's tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. And I'm begging you, if you've got people, one, drug addicts, uh, alcoholics, pro uh, pornography addicts, whatever their addiction is, you'll want them here tomorrow night. He is as, as energetic and passionate a person I've ever seen to reach the hurting. Number two, if you have anybody that was ever really wounded and burnt and out of church, they used to go to church, but for whatever reason they got out of church, you'll want them to hear his story. And I'm just pleading with you tomorrow night. Now, tonight will be great. The rest of the week will be phenomenal. But to tomorrow night, Richard will be preaching for us. Other than that, we've got a lot going on this week. Let's all stand together. Go by and meet the Jenkins family. Uh, John, Brandon, Mrs. Jenkins, uh, De Ashley. Debbie. Huh? What? Ashley. Ashley. Ashley, you should have played for us. Uh, Ashley was here a couple of months ago with the tour group. So get to meet them. Shake hands and fellowship. Guest visitors, come down and meet me. I have a gift for you. I love you. 6 o'clock tonight, you're dismissed.